uh, and declare his word this morning. I believe that my Bible is a living word of God. It inspires me, it guides me, and leads me in timeless truth. It has the authority to save me and to deliver me. It has the power to heal me, to restore me, and set me free. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We're talking last week about suffering, from suffering to glory. And I know we are talking about that this morning too, during our praise and worship and tithes and offerings at times that we are going through. And the story was in 1 Kings chapter 17 when the Lord began to uh, tell Elijah that there's a famine in the land, but I want you to go and remain in the book of Cherub and I will provide for you there. You know, there are times that God, when he speaks to you and he tells you, it does not make sense at times, but we got to be obedient to what he's saying. Got to be really obedient. And here, he, he remained in uh, uh, the brook, but then it says, the word says that after a while, the brook dried up. And so then the Lord gave him another word and said, now I want you to go to the widow's house of Zarephath. And there you will be taken care of. There you will be provided for. And she will give you shelter. She'll provide for you and your food and everything. And sometimes, you know, it's like, okay, Lord, I got to go again to this other spot. Okay, I'm going to go. It's about obedience and walking through it. But the whole story in that is that when, she, when he got there, and he told, and he saw her, and she was, she was just at home with her last piece of dough or flour that she had, a little oil that she had, and she was just gathering a few sticks to go in and make the last meal probably for her and her son. And he said to her, make me a cake, make me a piece of bread first before you do anything. And then she, then he began to stay with her, and he provide, She provided the upper room because what happened that the moment she obeyed and she did that, he said that there will be plenty in your house, and the 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 flour, the dough never went down. The oil continued to flow. He was in the upper room. He was there. He was probably praying, and the blessing of God continued to flow. But then all of a sudden, all of a sudden. The lady comes running to him with her son and says, what have you done? What is, what is going on? Have you come here to expose my sin? Have you come here to cause calamity? Have you, she probably thought that he has done something wrong and that's why I'm experiencing this. Sometimes we do, right? It's like we are Things are going good, and all of a sudden somebody comes up, and you think, we use the term, right? Don't be a Jonah, right? <laughs> it's like, what happened? Are you a Jonah over here? You know, causing calamity. But no. And she said, my son is dead. Have you come here to expose my sins? And Elijah, it's like I was just reading that passage, and I said it last week. It's like he says, give me your child. It's like as if he just said, out of frustration, grabbed it. He says, God, I'm here. He goes up to his room, places the kid on his bed, and he lies over him, and he cries out to him, and he says, God, what have you done? Here she is, providing for me. We have food, and the last thing that is, should be happening when goodness is flowing through is that her son dies. What have you done? to me, she says. But in all of that, she was suffering, she was struggling, she was going through, she was going through hardship, she was, before that, the famine was, was really thing, she was ready to die, and she was ready to give up. We talked about that last week. But Elijah, when he cried out to the Lord in prayer, and said, God, 
Lord, bring her son back. Give life into him. May he be revived back. May his life be returned to him. He began to pray. And then he came alive. And he brought the son down to the widow. She was going through a hard time. She was going through suffering. She was grieving for her loss. She had just lost her husband. And the, the one and only son that would probably after the famine is over. And if it did get over, or whenever it did get over. That was probably going to be our only source of provisions for her. Going to work for her. And bringing home what needs to provide food on the table. She was grieving, suffering. But then God knew that there was something else that was true, that God was trying to complete and thing. And so we talked about less last week that sometimes we jump to certain conclusions that are wrong conclusions in our lives. Wrong conclusions. Maybe God is punishing me. That's a wrong conclusion. God doesn't punish us, right? John chapter 9 verse 3, I didn't give it to her, but it was from last week. It says that it was not because of the sins or the, par or the parents' sins that Jesus answered to his disciples when he healed the blind person. And he says it's not because of their sins, but that the power, what has happened is that the power of God could be seen in them. So believe me, this morning when we are praying and when we are declaring things that God has spoken uh, over our finances, over our bodies, over our relationships and what he has spoken to us this morning, he says that my name may be glorified, that the power of God may be seen in us for the others so that they will know just like this lady, the widow in this passage says now I know for sure that you are a man of God now I know for sure that you serve a living God now I know for sure that there is a God that is a true God that provides and is alive that's the whole thing behind it. So if you're going through certain sufferings and, 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 and circumstances and pain in your life, just know this, that may, just maybe God has a bigger picture in that, that his name may be glorified and established over here. So we're going to continue in this. And it may be a little bit more brief, briefer today as I come to a close on this too. Uh, two-week series, Suffering from Suffering to Glory. Last week I asked you to write this down. It says, present pain, future glory. If you look in your Bible, some of us in our Bibles, whether it be King James or Living, New Living Translation, sometimes the title's on there. It says, uh, from suffering to glory, or uh, uh, suffering to glory. You know, So in that passage, it, it talks about it. And so we're going to go to the book of Romans this morning. And here's something I want you to understand this morning. And hear what the Lord is saying this morning. The book of Romans chapter 8. Verses 15 to 18. Romans chapter 8 verses 15 to 18. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And it says, so you have not received so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves instead you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children now we call him Abba Abba Father let me just stop right there for a moment and just say what happens when you go to a dad? What happens when you go to your father? Physical, right? Kids, we've all, some of us have been kids, we've all been kids at one point or another. If you recall a time, it's like when you go and talk to your dad and say that you want something. They either say, well, not for now, because it's not, it's not the right timing, or they'll say, yes, I'm going to give it to you, or there's a condition of, for it, right? Or maybe wait. 
but he wants to give it to you and he wants to bless you. The same way, the same way, Father God, he said, now we can call him as we are adopted as his own children. We're adopted into the family of God. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, when you come into the family, you are adopted and now you can call him Abba Father. Verse 16, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So how do we, we know that? It's our spirit bears witness. Our spirit bears witness with his. Verse 17, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. So what happens if you're heirs? Right? So that means the inheritance belongs to you. And we're talking about that this morning. The inheritance belongs to you. So you are heirs. In fact, it says over here, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Together with Christ. Not just us, not just ourselves, but with Christ. We are heirs of the glory, God's glory. But we, but if we are, are to share in his glory, get this, <laughs> But if we are to share in his glory, yes. we must also share in his suffering. Can you, King James says, if indeed we suffer with him, we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. So if you're going through suffering, if you're going through pain and struggles, there's a possibility that the Lord is trying to tell you that he's asking you that there is a time coming that you may be glorified with Christ because you're suffering with Christ. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory we will that he will reveal to us later. Eternity is forever. What we go through now, the pain and the suffering that we go through now is just for a season, it's for a time, but he has, we have eternity with him. He says where there is no more tears, there is no more sorrow, there is no more pain. No more suffering. But let me tell you something, church. I know, I know sometimes it's like, Pastor, what are you saying? So that means we have to suffer. I know that sometimes in some nations and some places when, when um, Good Friday comes along, they actually go and try and, you know, hurt themselves or they try and actually do crucifixions and and walk through and beat themselves and all that because they're trying to inflict pain and suffering on themselves so that they feel like they're being made righteous or, or more holy. It's not about that. It's not about that. Yes, God wants to bless you. Yes, God wants to heal you. Yes, God wants to. But there are times in our lives that certain things take place in our lives that he wants to show himself strong. He wants to that bring out in your life that the goodness of God in your life that others may see and say, hey, you know, I know you went through that, but you know what, I see God's presence, I see God's hand in that, I see his work in that. There are many things that are happening in our world today and we may say like, yes, it is crazy out there and how can this happen? How can good People experience bad things. We talked about that last week. Crazy things are happening. It's chaotic. Things are ugly out there. And not pretty at all. Economic wise. Political wise. Socially. It's just crazy out there. Bad things are happening everywhere around you. Not only to everybody else. But even to good people. And bad people. 
and we may question why, what it is. You know what, can I tell you something? It's okay to ask the Lord why. It's okay to question and say, God, I don't understand this, but I'm pretty sure that you know the whole picture and what's happening. I was thinking about this the other day because uh, if someone who's driving intoxicated, right? The drugs or alcohol, they're driving down the freeway and they get into an accident. All of a sudden, no one is asking why were they doing that? What happened? But as believers and Christians, as us who walk and, and trust God and believe God, the moment something crazy happens in our lives, the moment something in our lives takes place where there's pain and there's suffering, we begin to question, not others, but what do we do? Sometimes, some of us, I'm guilty of that at times, we question God. We question God. Could it be that as believers of our faith and our knowledge about God is not as strong? Let me tell you this. I'm raising my hand because there's a time and a place where I walked through that. It's not as strong it was as what it should have been. Is that the reason why that we had questioned? Could it be that we as believers have not seen the whole picture of what that God was trying to do and accomplish in our lives? Because some of us have been taught that we are saved, right? Yes, we are. That the blessing of the Lord, remember last week I said, you know, people, you say, I'm blessed and highly favored of God, right? Yes, we are. I'm a king's kid. I am blessed. I should be getting all the blessings of God and nothing else should be happening in my life. I'm highly favored. Yes, we are. But could it be that some of us don't know how to walk through when circumstances and storms of life come at us, when pain and suffering comes to us and we struggle with it? Jesus Christ is talking to the disciples and saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you say, you know, even at one, another point where he says, Rabbi. And he says, why do you say that? And he says, well, because you're good. And he says, there's only one that is good. That is the Father. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say and ask you to do? Luke chapter 6, at the end, last, last part of chapter 42 to 45, 46 or something like that. He's asking you why. Why do you do that? Because when the storms of life come, when these circumstances, when these storms and suffering and pain comes in your life, what do you stand on? Do you stand on the promises of God? Do you stand in the midst of that storm and say, I will not be shaken? Do you stand and declare his word, the promises that he has spoken and prophesied over you and say, God, every word that is sent out will accomplish that which it is sent for. It, shall, it will accomplish in my life. It will prosper in my life. I will do what you have asked me to do. I will continue to trust you. I will continue to follow you. Yet, in this broken world, we see brokenness. And we are not exempt from it. But the one thing we have going for us is that we are always victorious in that. Because we know who we know who is our redeemer. Jesus redeems us from intense sufferings. 
the cross of Jesus is the ultimate thing in our lives. And as furious it is and as, as demonic it was that did, you know, Christ hung on that cross and bore all of our sins and the sins of the world. He did it because revival was going to begin. Revival was going to break out in each one of us. Each one of us were going to turn to him. So can I say this this morning, church, that we are, crying, we are crying out to him. We are asking God to pour out his spirit upon us. And he is and is beginning to do that. And the word that was spoken to us this morning. But really speaking, it starts with each one of us. The cry of our hearts. Revival begins with us. It starts in our lives. It starts in the present of our pain and our struggles and, our, and, the, and the issues of life that we are going through because we know that we know for sure that we are completely dependent upon him. Yes. Not of ourselves. We're dependent on him. From suffering to glory. I say that because we suffer with him, with Jesus. It's another passage of scripture I want to read to you this morning. And it's in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verses 16 to 21. Verse 16 says, And since Abraham... Here we go again. We're talking about Abraham and Isaac again this morning, right? <laughs> and since Abraham and the other patriarchs were holy, their descendants were also holy, were called to be holy. Just as the entire batch of dough is holy because the portion given as an offering is holy. So remember this, when you, when you give something, when you give of yourselves, when you give of your, your life to God, you are being made holy. You are holy. The whole, you become holy. The portion given as an offering is holy. For if the roots of the tree are holy, the branches will be also so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, about being the branches, the vine and the branches. So what is holding the vine? The roots. The roots are holy. If the vine is holy, then the roots are holy. And the vine is holy, then the branches are holy. And you who are the branches are holy. And so when you are holy, then everything falls into place in regards to what God wants to do and accomplish in your life. And verse 17 says, but some of these branches from Abraham's tree, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles, we, who were the branches from a wild olive tree. Can somebody, can, can you read this with me this morning? And it says, we who, who, were, who were branches from a wild olive tree have been grafted in. If in your Bible, if you're reading that, you can underline that wild olive tree. Branches of a wild olive tree. Did you know you were wild? <laughs> Did you know you were wild? And some of you were wild before you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? You were a wild thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> wild thing, right? What's that song? There's a song that says, wild thing. You make my heart sing. Oh, my gosh. Cut that out, too. All right. <laughs> it's like, you know, I always associate certain things with songs. It's crazy, but... Um, wild. You are a wild thing. But you are grafted, grafted into the kingdom of God as joint heirs and sons and daughters of the 
holy God into the main you grafted in so you also receive the blessing God has promised so all of your promises all of the promises that are in his word you will also receive the blessing that God has promised Abraham and his children so it was declared this morning Abraham and Isaac through finances through that all of your finances will be taken care of provisions I love it because she had no idea who was going to talk about this. And God is confirming in his word different steps and places. So that Abraham and his children sharing in the rich nourishment from where? The root of God. Sharing from the rich nourishment from the root of God. So when you are attached, when you are the branch and you're connected and you're grafted to the vine, the roots are the one that God is providing you every nourishment that you need for survival for every part of your life. Nourishment from God's roots from the special olive tree. So you were from a wild olive tree and now you are connected to the special olive tree that brings nourishment. But you must not brag about being grafted to, a pre, to replace the branches that were broken off. You are just a branch and not the root. Verse 19, well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. <laughs> right? In, in the New King James Version, it says, well said. <laughs> it's like when I was reading it, and I was like, wow, well said. You made room for those, that those branches were broken off for me. But really, it says, yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And so when you're connected, the only thing that you need to do is believe in Christ. Because it is in him that you continue to grow and live and, and have your being. Amen? It is with him. When you're in him, you are with him. And when you're with him, you're in him and he's in you. Remember Jesus Christ, we talked about this before, that he says... You abide in me and I abide in you and you will bear much fruit. You got to remain in me. That's what it's talking about. That's what Paul's talking about over here to the Romans. And he says, because he's telling the Romans, he says, know that you are grafted. You are, you are brought in into the kingdom of God. And each one of us have that and the promises of God is upon us. But we have to believe because, and he says, you are there because you do believe. And if you do believe, Living Way family, to this morning, I want to declare and tell you that God has got you covered. He's got you covered. Verse 21. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Remember we talked about that when he prunes and he cuts away the bright branches. So he, does, he won't spare you either. He won't spare me either if there's no fruit. So it's important for us to understand that. It's important that we, that we continue to obey his commands. Amen? The suffering of Jesus Christ we have to come with him, be in him, experience, walk in the sufferings. But when we place our suffering in Christ's suffering, we will understand what pain and suffering is really all about. God's picture is always to bring us and deliver us, is always to restore us, but not before. His name is glorified. Not before the name of the Lord is lifted up. Amen. In closing, I have this last passage of scripture. Um, it's Job chapter 14. 
Job chapter 14 verses 7 through 9. It says over here in New Living Translation verse 7, it says, even a tree has more hope. Even a tree has more hope. If it is cut down, it will sprout again and grow new branches. We see it all the time in our backyard when we trim trees and you cut it down and all of a sudden there's more more branches. So know this, if God begins to take you and you're going through a suffering period, you're going through a pain, you're going through a trial, and if it needs to be taken out and if it's, you're struggling with it, know this, that when he removes that, that you are going to, that you're walking through it, that you are going to bear more branches which bring more fruit. This is the oldest book in the Bible, Job. He was walking it through, walking through this. Even his, his own friends said, go ahead and curse God and die because, you know, this is, it's over with. You're going through too much. Verse 8 says, though its roots have grown old in the earth and the stump decays. Sometimes we might experience that. We might think, God, this is too long. It's so old. It's going on and on forever. And it's decaying. It's like it's not happening. I don't see any life in it. I love this verse. It's verse 9. It says, yet at the scent of water. It's not even watered yet. But at the scent of water. The scent of water, it will bud and sprout again. So what's that mean? And it'll, like, it'll look like a new seedling. So what is, what is the Lord saying over here this morning? That through your suffering, through the glory at the end. That even at the scent of water, so that means you've got to water it. You've got to go before the Lord and allow the washing of the water the living water to flow in your life and say, God, your word is strength. Your word is light in my heart. Your word brings life. The Bible says that his word is life to our flesh. So whether it be physical or spiritual, at the scent of water, it will bud and sprout again like a new seedling. It will bud and bring forth branches like a plant should. So you're suffering? <laughs> Are you in trials? Are you struggling through certain things in your life, in your family, in relatives, finances? So water it with the word of God. Water it with the word of God so that it can be sprout and look like a new seedling again. Amen? I don't know about you, but you know, for sure, uh, several of us and some of us that we talk, and we, you know, I know that everybody at some place and some point in time, each one walks through difficulties in life and struggles, whether it be sickness, whether it is financial, whether it is relational. These are all hard things that we have to walk through. And we're trusting and believing God for his hand of mercy and grace upon it. But if we do not lose hope and we say, God, through the suffering of Jesus Christ, just as we read earlier that we, we read, it says that with him we suffer that we may be glorified with him, with Christ. There is always, there is always glory at the end for those that believe, for those that believe. And so I want to encourage you this morning, as you hear these words this morning, I know there's a few of you that needs prayer this morning and we are going to pray and believe God. We're going to open the altars up and we're going to thank God for what he's about to do. But I, I know that there's, that in your present pain, in your present struggles, in your present suffering, there is a future glory if we only trust him, if we only give it to him. Amen.